Scott Pilgrim vs. the World is a decade old, and this ode to the aimlessness of young adulthood still has a cult following. But while the film is whimsical, it also has its flaws. Here are aspects of the film that take on new meaning for adults. The very first line of the movie informs us that 22-year-old Scott Pilgrim is dating a high schooler, the 17-year-old Knives Chow. How old are you now, Scott? Like 28? Even though the audience subsequently learns that they haven't even kissed yet, it's still icky and only gets worse as you get further and further from high school yourself. You're too good for him. Run. <laughs> Some of Scott's friends, to their credit, point out that Scott is hiding in a safe, pressure-free non-relationship in the wake of a bad breakup the previous year. Others, however, are completely fine with the idea as Knives begins to attend Scott's band practice and shows. His roommate Wallace, for some reason, agrees to wait outside Knives' school with Scott until the final bell rings. At the film's end, Ramona even hints that Scott and Knives should get back together. What? You two make a good combo. In fact, the ending originally shot for the film had Scott and Knives getting back together. When that divided test audiences, it was revised to Scott and Ramona starting over instead. But speaking with Collider in 2021, Edgar Wright, the film's director, explained that even in making that adjustment, the key to it was that Knives lets him go. <laughs> I'm too cool for you anyway. So even now, the one-sided relationship that many would say has all the hallmarks of an adult man grooming a teenager is considered a legitimate side of a love triangle? As the years go by, that part of the movie gets harder to defend. In a 2007 essay for the AV Club about the movie Elizabethtown, pop culture critic Nathan Rabin coined a new phrase, saying, The manic pixie dream girl exists solely in the fevered imaginations of sensitive writer-directors to teach broodingly soulful young men to embrace life and its infinite mysteries and adventures. Within a few years, it became a widely used term to describe the many movies where a colorful, lively young woman like Kate Winslet in Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind or Natalie Portman in Garden State lures a mopey male protagonist out of his shell. I, I make a noise or I do something that no one has ever done before and then I can feel unique again even if it's only for like a second. It's intriguing to consider in retrospect whether Ramona Flowers conforms to this trope. While she's a more detached, quiet character than your bubbly Zoe Deschanel types, she unfortunately fits all the other stereotypes. She never appears in the movie on her own, what glimpses we do get of her life are only in regards to her past relationships, and the movie never explains what drew her to Scott in the first place. So in place of personality and character, the audience gets a female lead who has lots of exes and colorful hair along with a montage of people at a party telling Scott cryptic things about Ramona. She's got some battle scars, dude. There is a relatively fun, self-aware gag in the movie about Ramona appearing in Scott's dreams via a convenient subspace highway, which is how she becomes the girl of his dreams. But although Mary Elizabeth Winstead brings admirable depth to the role with her performance, as the years go by, it becomes harder not to wish there was more of a sense of who Ramona is when she's not simply servicing Scott's story. The way the LGBTQ characters are presented in Pilgrim might set off different reactions in focus groups today than it did a decade ago. Wallace Wells, Scott's gay roommate, has an active, seemingly polyamorous lifestyle, which is fine. Even Scott doesn't mind it, despite sharing the same bed. Good night, morning. Hey, Jimmy. Double standard! But it seems like Wallace can't have a single conversation without asking if boys go to knife school or pretending that the girl Scott is referring to is a boy. From stealing Scott's sister's boyfriend during a concert to watching Lucas Lee film a movie because he's his crush, it really is bizarre how every opportunity Wallace has to speak turns into an opportunity to reinforce his sexual identity. Kieran Culkin's performance makes Wallace consistently amusing, but revisit the movie again and you'll be amazed at how one note the character feels. Roxy Richter, meanwhile, is all but ridiculed as a phase by Ramona when she's revealed to be her fourth evil ex. Given no backstory or flashback other than Ramona saying she was once by curious, Roxy seems to exist just to make some lesbian-related puns. Well, honey, I'm a little bi Fury. <laughs> 
Another strange aspect of Scott Pilgrim vs. the World you might notice as you get older and more worldly is its off-kilter relationship with non-white characters. Matthew Patel, the first of Ramona's evil exes, is of Indian-Canadian heritage, a fact that isn't terribly relevant until he launches into a Bollywood dance number near the end of his fight with Scott. The fifth and sixth evil exes, the Katayanagi twins, fall into the silent Asian stereotype that was once called out last year by Mulan actor Jimmy Wong. Even Knives, while she gets plenty of lines and time to shine as a character beyond her ethnicity, is referred to in a strange, loaded moment as Scott is talking to his friends. Knives Chow? She's Chinese. Wicked. It's a small moment, but it plays into the larger trope of fetishizing Asian female characters, one that has come under fire in the years since the film's release. Scott Pilgrim is unemployed. He's also 22 and dating a high schooler in a strange, sexless, pretend relationship. He shares a studio apartment with another man who owns all of the furniture and the lone bed. This studio apartment is across the street from the house where Scott grew up. Other than perhaps playing bass in an unheralded band, there isn't much about Scott Pilgrim that doesn't scream loser. Scott spends nearly the entirety of the film's runtime acting whiny, insecure, and selfish. He cheats on his high school girlfriend, then dumps her without explanation. He makes the barest attempts at apologies and introspection right before the film is over, but it's clear he hasn't grown much by the movie's conclusion. Hey! Hey, mind if I tag along? If they were to make a sequel, we'd most likely discover 10 years later that Scott is still not nearly as cool as the original film frequently made him seem. Chris Evans has appeared as Captain America in the Marvel Universe in 11 different movies. It's hard not to imagine what comedic roles he turned down to spend a decade in spandex after re-watching his uproarious turn as Lucas Lee in Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. Beginning with the moment he cracks his neck in time with the Universal Pictures fanfare, Evans generates the most consistent laughs per minute of any of the evil exes or perhaps any character in the film. Playing an absurdly aggro movie star in a bit of self-parody after his two movie turns as a pre-MCU Human Torch in the Fox Fantastic Four movies, Evans has perfect timing in declaring that Scott Pilgrim is no competition and throwing him into Toronto's iconic Casaloma. Hi. Big fan. Why wouldn't you be? With Captain America now behind him, Evan's sly turn in Knives Out is hopefully just the tip of more interesting, diverse roles to come. Beyond whether she qualifies as a manic pixie dream girl, cliche or not, Ramona Flowers has a frustrating lack of agency in Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. This feels all the more grating when you grow up and realize how complicated a good love story can be in movies disciplined enough to properly develop one. It's entirely unexplained why Ramona invites Scott back to her place and makes out with him on a date that was explicitly pitched as a platonic hangout. While the revelation of the League of Evil Exes complicates her story and explains some of her detached attitude, it's not terribly clear how the League haunting her makes her feel other than as it pertains to Scott. When she abruptly leaves Scott to return to her ex Gideon, it's a bummer but at least a decisive action that hints at deeper motivations. But even that turns out to be telling someone else's story, as Gideon has attached a mind control device to the back of her head, transforming her entirely into a damsel in distress for the film's big action climax. Adding insult to injury, she mostly takes a back seat in the showdown with Gideon, as Scott and Knives do most of the fighting. Scott Pilgrim vs. The World was celebrated upon its release for having an array of diverse female roles. But in actuality, it fails the standard bearer test of representation in cinema known as the Bechdel test. Named for cartoonist Alison Bechdel, it goes like this. To pass the test, a film must have at least two female characters that talk to one another about something other than a man. Revisiting Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, it never quite passes. Even when Ramona, Knives, Envy, or others make small talk with another female character, it's always about Scott, Gideon, or some other mutual male friend or ex-boyfriend. The Bechdel test sounds so simple. Give your character enough depth to say something other than a line that advances the male antagonist's story. 
But in films like Pilgrim, it is apparently impossible to imagine these female characters having their own distinct lives. As adults, it's easy to be hard on an unemployed loser like Scott Pilgrim. As it's a coming-of-age story, you might say he's supposed to be a loser in the beginning. Surely, he grows and changes over the course of the film. In a word, no. Scott spends the majority of the film as a self-centered, entitled, whiny, and defensive character. When he reluctantly admits to Knives and Ramona that he cheated on both of them, he at last has an opportunity to act mature. But Gideon stabs him in the back, killing him. In a video game twist, an extra life that Scott earned earlier allows him to come back and replay the final fight again. This time, he gets a brief monologue where he reveals to Knives and Ramona that he cheated on them voluntarily, but still doesn't have to deal with any significant consequences. So are we all good? Never felt better. In this final sequence, the first time through, he fights Gideon with a sword he earned through the power of love. But on the second pass, he earns it through the power of self-respect. This makes no sense, because Scott has demonstrated that, if anything, he has too much self-respect. Is there a sword you earn by respecting the women in your life? Because Scott needs to earn that one. Scott Pilgrim vs. The World is largely a video game-inspired fantasy, so maybe it's not fair to hold it to a coherent standard in terms of today's gender politics, but the older you get, the more you start to realize that The League of Evil Exes is more than just a framework to structure the story around. It's toxic masculinity in its purest form. Without much nuance or backstory, the fighting in the movie reduces dating to a tournament where Ramona is the prize, objectifying women as objects to be fought over instead of human beings with willpower, thoughts, and feelings. While this is partially the result of distilling a six-volume graphic novel into a two-hour film, it ultimately creates something that's fun and flashy but reduces gender roles to a digital binary. Men are stoic warriors, while women are princesses and towers to be claimed as rewards. With the exception of Michael Cera, virtually every member of the cast of Scott Pilgrim vs. The World was more or less on the rise, and has seen their careers blossom in the years since. Looking back now, you see Aubrey Plaza before Parks and Recreation, Chris Evans and Brie Larson before the MCU got them, Anna Kendrick before Up in the Air and Pitch Perfect, and the list goes on. But when the film hit theaters in 2010, the consensus seemed to be that Ellen Wong had stolen the show as Knives Chow and seemed poised to be the film's breakout. In the years since, Wong has worked steadily, playing a semi-prominent supporting role on Netflix's Glow for three years before its cancellation. Yet the Ellen Wong mania that seemed about to materialize a decade ago never quite went down as planned. Looking back now as an adult, perhaps it's time to once again appreciate her performance and seek out some of the smaller roles she's capably filled in the years since. Check out one of our newest videos right here, plus even more Looper videos about your favorite movies are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.